Hi everybody, I'm John Casey. Welcome to the latest one-hour edition of Inside Basketball. And with just seven rounds of the regular season remaining, it's definitely crunch time, with the playoff picture being further complicated by the late charge coming from the Wildcats. We'll cross to Perth's NBL Player of the Week, James Harvey, for an explanation in just a moment. But first, it's time to introduce our guests in the studio, Mr Basketball, Andrew Gaze and Brisbane star Simon Curl and completing our troika of those who have either been injured this season or are hurt at the moment, direct from knee surgery. It's Mr. Steve Carfino. I think it's just all that wear and tear from when I was a player. I've been a little bit overweight and just that extra jarring <laughs> of, of poundage on those joints has really taken its toll. The end of the end of the road for Steve Carfino. First, though, to some recruiting news, and the Sydney Kings will neither confirm nor deny rumours that they are considering re-employing Isaac Burton. The exciting two guards suited up for the Kings in 1996 and 97 before a season with Newcastle and was named Defensive Player of the Year in his first NBL stint. Burton was involved in a point shaving controversy in the US but with moves like this he may just provide that extra zing the Kings need to get back on track. They move the ball swiftly around the perimeter and Isaac Burton comes up with a monster jam! One new face who has been confirmed is Adrian A.D. Smith, a forward from Oregon who has joined the Wildcats despite Perth claiming a few weeks ago that they didn't need anyone else. Smith arrived fresh off the plane to witness the new team demoralise the Sydney Kings last Sunday night and if everything goes to plan he should be making his debut this Saturday night when Perth clashed with the Canberra Cannons at home. And from Melbourne comes news that the Tigers have been dragged kicking and screaming into the real economic world with a multi-million dollar partial buyout from private owners. Without the new money, which is coming from both Australian and US-based businessmen, the Tigers may have folded. Melbourne is also planning to move some matches away from Vodafone Arena because of financial concerns. And with Andrew Gaze here, let's pop the question. New money coming in, does that mean that you and Lindsay finally will draw a paycheck? <laughs> oh, I'm, I don't think it's... Um necessarily been presented as in the light that I think the club would like to think. I think that it's just the, the sign of the times, professional sport and um, you know we're the last of, of the teams that have been run by an association and, and um, you know clearly with the, the commercial realities of the game these days you need to make those, those sort of changes and equity partners have been brought in and um, you know hopefully that'll guarantee our, our long-term future. I, I don't think that we're from, I don't, I'm not privy to all the information, but from what I understand, I don't think we're in an extreme situation or, or, or one where you say, well, we're going to go belly up tomorrow or anything like that. But I just think it's a natural evolution of the sport and in particular our club. And Simon, uh, we've mentioned the Tigers also looking at moving away from Vodafone because of financial reasons as well. How do you enjoy the Taking It To The Streets program or would you rather be playing matches at the Superdome or big city type stadiums? Well, I, I don't necessarily, we played out at uh, Shoalhaven this year and, you know, I, I don't think, you know, I'm not a big fan of driving, you know, two hours to play in front of 300 people. You know, I don't think that really benefits Wollongong and it def definitely doesn't benefit us. I think, uh, you know, I, I prefer to play, I mean, I like the Kings, the old place they used to play, the Entertainment Centre. To me, that was, you know, one of the best venues in the, in the country. It was a good feel, atmosphere was great, uh, very good floors, good rim. Uh, and, you know, you didn't have to drive 40, 50 minutes through some crazy traffic to get to the game. How do you feel about preseason games being played in smaller cities like that? Yeah, I think that'd be a lot better. You know, at least it gives the, the people out in the country areas a bit of a feel for basketball and, you know, they might want to drive that, that hour and say it's worth, worth checking it out. I think, I think it's also a matter of, um, you know, the, the style of the venue as well and, and its location. Um, obviously when it's in those regional centres it's a little bit difficult to get to, sometimes it's a bit of a challenge, but um, you know you have the other extreme like the Brisbane Stadium which is a you know, fantastic stadium. If, if you've got that full when you know, there's only three and a half, four thousand people in there, it can be just as good as atmosphere as playing in somewhere where there's eight or nine thousand. So it really does depend on the, the style of the venue and, and the atmosphere you can create in them as much as it does the, the, the volume of people, the number of people. Well, one great place to play is the Perth Entertainment Centre. James Harvey, your crowd was serving it up to the Kings there over the weekend. There were chocolate bars everywhere. There were, in fact. I think they jumped on your bandwagon case and, uh, and loved the whole Violet Crumble theme. And there were, there were massive banners and Violet Crumbles given out all night. And it was, it was fantastic. 
interesting to have those two games and then uh, to see you come out in such fantastic form, you personally and also the team against uh, the Sydney lineup. Um, you know, obviously happy with the way things are going. Yeah, I think so. We, you know, we're back on track now, or certainly heading that way. And uh, we've got a couple of big games this coming up against Canberra and Brisbane, but certainly against quality sides like the Tigers and Sydney to uh, to do a job on them, and and particularly down the stretch, it was they were tough games, and, and we got over the hump at the end of the game was was huge for us. And, and personally, it was some good form. And Ricky Grace doing an excellent job again. Shane Hill had a good one for the Sydney Kings, but when Rogers combines with Ricky Grace, uh, it's a fantastic one-two option you've got going there, James, and no doubt you're going to create some problems because when Paul Rogers is switched on, rarely can someone guard him. Yeah, I think so. He's been in uh, back in that MVP form, and I think certainly uh, with the addition of Rob and myself coming back from injury, you know, the perimeter threats have allowed him to, to open up his game, and I think he, uh, at the start of the year, was struggling a bit mentally, probably not enjoying it as much, and... Uh, you know, certainly he's, he's picked up his levels of intensity and, and he seems to just be having fun again, which, which won him the MVP and us the championship. And uh, what can you tell us about the new recruit? Uh, I can't tell you much, apart from the fact that on appearance he has the biggest head you've ever seen. <laughs> but um, he, does, he does look solid and he's got some nice post moves. I've only seen him in one practice session. Um, obviously he suffered from the Pacific shrink shrinkage a little bit. He's probably not quite the 204 or 205 that we thought he would be, but you know, he definitely looks solid and, and with Andrew's ankles uh, deteriorating rapidly, we need somebody in that four spot to help us out. What about um, the fact you're bringing in A.D. Smith um, with the, the, the line-up and, and how he's going to be used? We talk about him maybe coming as a replacement for Vlahov, but what is there a specific role that you're looking for him to play? Um, I think more than anything, I mean, it would be good if you could come in and, and be able to do some, some big things for us in terms of point production and rebound production, but I think really it's, it's a security blanket. We just don't know exactly how bad Andrew is. And, and uh, with Hoff, you know, he's obviously getting on and those glass ankles of his that have been welded straight. Um, it's pretty tough for, for him to back up and train all week and then play and, and double headers, etc. So more than anything, if this guy can give us 15 to 20 minutes uh, of solid basketball, anything above that is, is a bonus. Well, James Harvey, MVP in Perth's win against the Melbourne Tigers. But if we take a look at the highlights, we'll see a lot of Marcus Timmons. It was a breakout game. Season high, 30 points, including a number of dunks against one of his former teams. And interestingly, the Melbourne Tigers, their average assist per game has gone up in Andrew Gaze's absence. Dave Smith and Leonard Copeland working well in the backcourt together. But no big man in the NBL is better than Paul Rogers from close range. And having Ricky Grace obviously helps out. And when he's not dishing... Well, Ricky can score himself. Four championship rings are proof of that. And despite a big last quarter from Leonard Copeland, Perth held off Melbourne to win by six points. And no doubt they'll be keen to get Andrew Gaze back into the ranks. But what did you make of the trip over to Perth, Drewy? Yeah, I never went on the trip, so I didn't see the game in Perth. But um, I think right throughout the last uh, four games before our win against Townsville, the four games that we lost, they were very close margins. We had a tough game against Brisbane and, um, you know, we had some, a close loss against Canberra. And again, from what I understand, the boys played pretty well. It was a pretty high standard game up in Perth. So um, it wasn't like we're, we're miles away from it. And it's just about making some adjustments with my absence and a few of the other guys taking on slightly different roles. And I think that through practicing, we've been able to come to terms with that and we should be able to improve from here on out. Well, James, now be truthful here. Without Andrew Gaze in the Tigers lineup, what was the mindset going in? You must be thinking this is an easier proposition without Andrew than with him playing. No question, but I mean, obviously, Leonard Copeland is very unpredictable, and particularly having to start on him early in the game was probably more worrying for me than, than having Drewy there, obviously. But, but certainly, uh, we, it's hard not to go in a little bit complacent, I think, against the Tigers without you know the best, best Australian player that's ever been produced. So. I think, uh, you know, it was a tough game. They did play very well. They played a lot better and took it right up to us. And like I said earlier, we only really got over the hump in, in late in the fourth. Well, the Tigers had to bounce back against the Townsville Crocs at Vodafone Arena in the first quarter. Those guys really got out to a good start. Marcus Timmons, Leonard Copeland, and Mark Bradkey combined for all 40 points in the first quarter of that basketball game. They were on fire. Then Townsville's D chipped, it, chipped back at that 22-point quarter-time deficit. Andrew Goodwin finishing the game with 24 points. David Smith continued his good form. He had six assists in this basketball game, managed to pick up nine points and to go, with that, to go with those assists. Now call the police. Leonard Copeland gets stripped by Sean. 
Harvey. Man, I couldn't think of his last name there. And he had four steals to go along with this play right here. This is the last play of the basketball game. Leonard or Marcus Timmons is long. Mark Radke has a strip. Then Harvey, this is the play he wants to have back because David Smith takes the basketball and they go out with the win. David Smith picked those two free throws off and the Tigers came with a very important win there. David Smith tried to miss the second one, but that didn't work, but they still got the job done. But I think Sean Harvey there in that situation, Steve, shows how difficult it is to bring in a new player late. He obviously didn't see where he was passing the ball, not comfortable if Rob Rose had the ball, perhaps a different scenario, just want to get a shot off. It's probably being a little bit harsh on Sean Harvey. I, I just think that he wasn't aware of how much time was on the clock. He looked hesitant. The trap wasn't a real strong one. They don't want to foul him. So he had two big guys there. They weren't two real perimeter defenders. So I, th I thought he had an opportunity to get there. He had like six or seven seconds. I just thought it was one of those plays that, you know, he'll probably dread for a long time. Well, he wasn't the only one with problems. The Sydney Kings have big problems at the moment, not the least of which were the Wollongong Hawks over the weekend. And the Hawks, well, they humiliated Sydney in a great all-round display. Here's Melvin dunking on top of Ben Melmoth. Matt Nielsen decided he didn't want any more of that, so he decided to club Charles Thomas, which was a mistake because Charles got angry and unloaded 34 points and 12 assists. Wollongong had more points at three-quarter time than Sydney managed for the entire match. 78 in total was the Kings' lowest score of the year. The Hawks looking every bit that seemed to beat for the title. And Charles had plenty to say after the match as well. But on that performance, Steve, we were there. They were very impressive. I think defensively they came out and they really limited the things that the Sydney Kings did. Of course, they really tried to cut down on Shane Hill's looks and his involvement in the basketball game. But every time they had to close out, they, they had really hard closeouts and prevented the shot and were able to get to guys on the drive. They just had a very good defensive game. It was very difficult for Sydney to get a score. Well, just before we say farewell to James Harvey over in Perth, let's preview the match between the Perth Wildcats and the Canberra Cannons. And it doesn't have to be said, James, but it is going to be a crucial match, particularly for the Wildcats. No question. You know, with a couple of guys returning to Perth as well, I think Charles Goser and Banks and Cal Bruton and Geordie Cullen, they all have attachments and ties to Perth. So that they'll be coming over here ready to fire and, and we'll have to be on our game to beat them. Well, the Cannons are one of those teams that have difficulty on the road and you yourself you shoot very well at home you know can you feel any empathy for them? Uh, not really no but I think um, you know th that's that's what's made our venue so tough over the past few years as opposed to others that it's not only traveling a long distance to Perth that, that hurts teams it's also walking into the PEC you know you get the the uni loonies and the Hawaiians all behind the basket going crazy and they they hammered Shane Hill all, all night and they hammered Leonard Copeland and, and it has to affect people and I think a team that's a bit younger and not quite as experienced like Canberra might struggle to deal with that. Well, James, great to have you on the program. Great to see you back in form as well for the Perth Wildcats. Good luck over the weekend. Thanks, guys. James Harvey joining us there from Perth, and we'll head to the break with highlights of the aforementioned man who claimed the NBL's Player of the Week award. <laughs> to Inside Basketball with Simon Curl in full flight, but getting some flack there from Andrew Gage, wanting him to dunk it. When was the last time you were above the rim? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a while ago, but... Uh, probably... as, as the wise man once said, mate, you know, until a dunk's worth three points, then I'll, I'll keep never, laying the ball never up. Never a more okay. intelligent word spoken. <laughs> <laughs> I think that wise man was hammer. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, uh, 40 minutes in that game, your first start since coming back from injury. Uh, are you 100%? Are you getting near 100%? Well, I don't think I really justified the 40 minutes on the weekend, you know. Um, came out in the first quarter, felt pretty good, strong and aggressive. Um, but, you know, as the game went on, you know, I think uh, I th three, for, three for 11 the first half and maybe confidence waned on me a little bit there and only got up one or two shots the second half. And just, you know, it's, it's slowly coming. You know, it wasn't, wasn't a great game for me, but 
you know, hopefully next week will be a bit, bit, bit better. Even the matches that you've come off the bench since you returned from injury, though, your assist count has been very high and your shot attempts have been down. You're obviously being a little bit more selective in what you're doing. Well, I think with the team that we have this year, it's, it's not as if I have to come in and take 20, 25 shots. Um, and it's, you know, we've got everybody contributing on a very good level. You know, Damien Ryan's doing very well. Wade Halliwell's doing a lot better this year. You know, everybody's stepped up. So for me to come out and take those kind of shots, I think, will be very detrimental to the team. So it's just trying to fit in and get that, get that. I think I'm still having a bit of trouble getting, you know, when to shoot, when not to shoot, you know, when to do my own thing. When. So i just got to pretty much let it, let it flow and, you know, not really attack it like I did last year. Did you underestimate how tough that would be? I mean, to have the free, the green light like that, free reign, and then have to come back and do a role. I mean, it's it's something that every good player is willing to do to get more wins, to take a lesser role. But it must be more, it must be very difficult. I think the difficult part is if you lose and you know you, you haven't you haven't scored a decent amount of points or haven't been aggressive enough, then you know people might say, well, you know, you should have been more aggressive. So, you know, it's slowly coming. You know, I think just I have to play within the confines of the team. We saw Bradley Sheridan uh, get off for an equal career high in this 121 points. Simon, an X factor, did he get away from you a little bit, slip under your guard, so to speak? Yeah, I think though in the zone that we were running, certain times we, we really wanted, if we're going to have anyone to shoot it on the floor, you know, Brad, you know, he's, he's not a bad shooter, but you don't want Tony or Jason Smith or, or Darren really lining it up. And uh, Bobby Brannon is uh, Sheridan getting upstairs. He does this in patches if he could maintain it through the course of a year. He's going to be in the Australian team, no doubt. But Bobby Brandon and Chris Anstey banged heads. Anstey taken off with blood pouring all over his face. But Bobby Brandon has been super impressive this year. Yeah, he's, he's, he started off a little slow and copped a, a lot of criticism. But, you know, he, he's very aggressive. You, you real, I mean, as Chris Anstey found out, when he's going to the rack, you know, you better get out the way. And rebounding, he's just a bull. He's a bull on the boards. But... Mate, I don't know about your comment about Bradley Sheridan. It keeps going that way. He's going to be in the Australian squad. That's a pretty tough call you made right there, isn't it? You don't think he's good enough for the Australian team? Oh, not right now, mate. There's no, not few, at the moment. In how the future. Far track are you talking, mate? Next Olympic Games? Jeez, it's a big call, mate, for a man who hasn't averaged double figures in the last four years. But it has been a member and captain of the Australian junior team, performed well overseas well, internationally. Sure, I think the natural pr progression yeah. will get him into the well, Boomers team. People probably thought that about Aaron Traher too, but his progression to the Australian team wasn't real productive either, was it? No, I'm not going to win this battle. Let's move on. <laughs> I can't wait. Really we'll run out of time. Sitting, <laughs> was sitting there kind of quiet for quite a while. I was wondering when he was going to erupt. And he kind of normally picks on the person next to him. Yeah, he just went straight That's across court. Right well, there. we'll get something worked out for that. But let's talk about West Sydney and Townsville because they are always involved in interesting matches and this one was an important one because of the top six results but it was John Rilly's sweet outside shooting. They got the pigs off to a great start with all their guns blazing where Sydney led by 15 at quarter time and eventually won by 16 and once again it was left to the veterans who to step up for the Crocodiles. Pat Reedy, Robert Rose getting the job done but the addition of Sean Harvey causing some rotational problems for them although the form of Brad Davidson is no doubt pleasing for Ian Stacker. But seven of eight from long range from John Rilly kept Townsville at bay and no doubt the Crocs will try and keep him under wraps when they journey to the pig pen again next week. What a performance that was. John Rilly was just going off and with some advice for the fans. Seven of eight, that's good numbers in anyone's language. I heard he was having a little bit to say to Sean Harvey, but when he starts getting it going and spinning around and wagging his tongue, you know he's feeling pretty good. That's for sure. It's enjoyable to watch. And no doubt, Andrew and Simon, you spent some time matching up on John Rilly. Is he difficult to guard? He's got some range. I tell you, he's uh, got some range and he doesn't mind shooting the ball. So when you, when you mix those two together, it's, it's pretty lethal. And, he, and he's all energy. He, he's constantly moving. I'd say he'd be one of the best small guys rebounding. He's not that small, but he, for a guard, he'd probably be one of the best rebounders. Who who's done, I don't know him that well, but he doesn't appear to have all that athleticism you know he's not a huge athlete but just reads the play and has a fantastic instinct for the game he goes to the offensive boards very well it's uh, it's something when you're defending even though the shot goes up you you really have mm. to box him out yeah, statistically he's the second best rebounding guard in the league but let's talk about Canberra against the Adelaide 36ers our apologies for no highlights from this match our friends in Canberra couldn't make them available or weren't forthcoming with them or something along they those lines <laughs> but Adelaide well they win by four points but they trailed at three quarter time CJ Bruton had 32 points and Matt Garrison 14 in the last quarter to help Adelaide across the line but Canberra have now lost 
three games that they led at three-quarter time, and we'll look at the NBL ladder a little later, but if they had won those matches, Steve, they'd be 10 and 10. They'd be right in the mix for a top six spot. But having lost those three, one wonders about them getting to the playoffs. I mean, that's a big if, you know. You have to win close games if you're going to have a shot at making the playoffs and then going on any further. Because what's the use of making the playoffs if you're going to get knocked out right away? I think your dad was the one who said that <laughs> so eloquently. But the thing is, they haven't been able to finish the close games. And they look like they're rattled at the end of the game, too, and a lot of close ones. So I'm not surprised. One team that doesn't look rattled toward the end of a match is the Victoria Titans. After beating Brisbane, they then traveled to Cairns, came up with a Victory here by 10 points as well. Chris Anstey had one of his better games. There he is carrying the scars from the previous night. But Cairns, well, they started the season well. They've beaten Victoria twice, the only team to do that this year. Jason Wells again put up good numbers, but Victoria find a way to win, whether it's on the road, whether it's at home, whether they have injuries. You have to like the way they go about their job, Steve. Well, I mean, they play hard. They, they come hard defensively. They have a game plan. They're not going to beat themselves. They're not going to self-destruct. They have a great system in place. You know, if you had any criticism for them, especially early in the year, they couldn't shoot the ball from the perimeter, and they had those big scoring droughts. But defensively, you know, they're rock solid. If anything, their offense was putting pressure on their defense earlier in the year. But now with Jason Smith back into the lineup, that extra gun out there, and they feel just a little more comfortable on the offensive end. They're very tough. Wollongong and Victoria, the two hottest teams in the NBL at the moment. Coming up next, Mr Magic's Plays of the Week and a preview of the clashes coming your way in Round 18 of the NBL. But first, sit back and admire these skills. Marcus Timmons faking the uh, at a Rob Feaster. Look at this. Uh, uh. Yeah, you can go back and pick up your shorts, Rob, because he gave you some. D Mac and Jason Wells discuss where to get one of these fly headbands. <laughs> Thank you, my man. Got none but love for you, dog. <laughs> Battle of the Peroxide Blondes. The pick, the roll, and the jam. Be the ball. Think basketball. You think this guy came with a date? I don't think so. Plenty of emotion shown in a basketball game. Here's passion. There's anger. And there's love. Oh, yeah, that feels good. What happens when you're six foot nine, can run, shoot, and jam, and do all those things? Finish plays like that? 
His future's so bright, he's got to wear shades. Look what you started, John Casey. Violet crumble wrappers from the Perth fans. Oh, that's tough. The Thomas brothers, Charles to Melvin for the jam. No relation, but the brothers get it. And the bump and run from James Harvey. Boop. Looks good, is good. And Charles Thomas, let's get something straight. Showboating on plays of the week. We'll get you plenty of run, pretty boy. I love it. Oh, yeah. Need some work done around the house? Call the handyman. Guard to guard alley-oop. Top quarter performance goes to Leonard Copeland. He had 20 in the first quarter against the Crocs because he was hot. He was also 5 of 9 from downtown. Somebody find him because he cannot be stopped. And get a body on him because he's working the glass as well because this man needs to be contained. Without Andrew Gaze in the lineup, Leonard Copeland has to do double the work, and in this game, he could not be shut down. But the play of the week goes to Paul Rogers from the Perth Wildcats on an excellent pass from Andrew Vlaw off the jam. A bad landing. Paul Rogers needs to work on that one. Let's see it again. Paul Rogers with the reverse jam, and check out the landing. Ooh, not too good on the ligament inside the leg, but that, my friends, is blah, 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 blah. Never a dull moment with Steve's plays of the week. Yeah, it was always enjoyable. Paul Rogers, he does land bad a lot, you know? He hurt himself in Adelaide and looked like he hurt himself there. And this man's hurt himself at the moment, but Drew, uh, we wish you a speedy recovery. Look forward to seeing you back on the pine. Oh, I look forward to be there, and you, you piked, uh, pumped up the uh, NBL website, but the, the real basketball website is, as you know, Casey, you visit it all the time. It's www.gaze.com.au. Free out. plug for that, and a free plug for Nike from Simon Kill. Thanks for joining us. Always entertaining. Thank you. Hope you have enjoyed the show, Steve. No, you have. Yeah, no, I always enjoy when Simon's on there. I think he needs a hug or a role model He's or something. He's got to go home and justify 25 grand to his missus, though. <laughs> <laughs> Nicky Carpino's on the phone. Sorry about the kitchen, sweetheart. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you again next week here on Inside Basketball. This has been a Fox Sports production for the 10 Network.